Welcome in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who lets nothing come between him and his church. We begin our worship in singing our opening hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The introit is from Psalm 105. O oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Pr sing praises to him. Tell of all of his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles, the judgments he uttered. O offspring of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. O give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. We continue with the Kyrie. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. 
Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you. Almighty and everlasting God, give us an increase of faith, hope, and love, that receiving what you have promised, we may love what you have commanded. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the eighth Sunday after Pentecost is from Deuteronomy chapter 7. You are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers, that the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For from him and through him, and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Our epistle lesson is taken from Romans chapter 8. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the close of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? He said to him, Yes. And he said to them, Therefore every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for today's message is taken from our epistle reading from Romans chapter 8 with an emphasis on these words. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, who more than that was raised, who is seated at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. This is our text, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. Friends, at this point in 2020, you might very well be on the brink of asking yourself, if you haven't already, what else could possibly go wrong? I know for many of us this year has been particularly challenging, and it's hard to think that it's barely halfway over. First, there's the obvious. COVID-19 hit us at the beginning of March, and it feels like our lives have been pretty much upside down ever since. We miss meeting together. We miss eating out at restaurants with loved ones. We miss shopping without a mask. We miss seeing a movie in the theater. We miss all other kinds of things that this miserable disease has taken away from us. But then, of course, there are all the usual stressors of our sin-stained world to consider as well. Political turmoil, as we seem to be in the habit of each election year, has certainly not been put on hold. Adding to this are riots and protests, racial, racial strife on a level not seen in our nation since the civil rights movement, scandals involving human trafficking syndicates, Neuralink technology threatening to beam advertisements directly into your brain, and if you didn't see it on the news already, now it seems that Yeezy is running for president. It's no small wonder that we're seeing on t- what we're seeing on TV and social media has many people saying that the year 2020 is somehow cursed, that this is the just desserts for our nation and our world that they have brought on to themselves by their political striving or self-serving ways. Anxieties are now running high. Workplace anxiety, homebound anxiety, anxiety between family and friends, separation anxiety. You may consider it small consolation then in light of many of the troubles that I just mentioned, but I want to assure you today, 2020 is not cursed, as some people claim. No, that would just be ridiculous. Rather, humanity is cursed. I know what you're thinking. Oh, gee, pastor, that's not much better. But wait, I want you to hear me out this morning. From the moment that we are conceived, Scripture reveals to us that we are born under the curse of sin. It is because of this curse that 2020, for many of us, has been so terribly stressful. It's also the reason for any other awful day, week, or year that you remember. Because of sin, our days on this earth are numbered. We are frail, weak, and flawed even at our best, and all of these problems and anxieties we have, in a very real way, remind us that we are poor, miserable sinners. Bo Geertz, a a former bishop of the Lutheran Diocese of Sweden, had a special term for this kind of harsh reminder that we all undergo. He called it the hammer of the law. You see, the law of God has as its second function the purpose of showing us our sin. It does this through the law's own innate power to accuse us. When we fall ill, when we make a mess of things by our lies, our selfishness, our pride, when we face death, this is the accusatory power of the law bearing down on us pronouncing us guilty of sin and showing us the consequences of our crimes. The law makes plain the consequences of sin. And the time that we live in now has showed us plainly what many of those consequences look like. This is why so many people recoil in disgust when talking about the state of our world. They see in the world a reflection of their own sinful and fallen nature. 
We don't like to stand accused, particularly when we know that we're guilty. The hammer of the law does not beat around the bush. The wages of sin is death. That is what we read in the scriptures. We've seen a lot of death this year, whether it be on the news or up close and personal. Death is our just desserts for the many wrongs that we have done. And it is part of the reason that so many people feel completely and utterly lost right now. Death separates us from the ones we love. It punishes us. It wears us down. It would claim to destroy us and even try to separate us from our God. The worst part of all of this is that we do it to ourselves. We bring it upon ourselves. All have sinned, and all have fallen short of the glory of God. And yet, in Romans 8, we hear some very different words concerning the separation brought about by death, don't we? If any of you are clinging to the hope that 2020 is going to pull some kind of dramatic turnaround, that people will be kinder to one another, the economy will somehow surge, we're going to see a miraculous cure for COVID, or that all of our personal problems will evaporate, then, dear friends, hear the hammer of the law as it tells you that your hope might be in the wrong place. If anything, we might expect some of these things to get worse in the coming times. But that's not where Romans 8 leaves us. Romans 8 gives us this hope, that in spite of the fact that we are poor, miserable sinners, that we are weak and weary, hopeless and dying, St. Paul still asks the question, who is to condemn us? You might notice that I added the word us here to the English for two reasons. One, to be closer to the original Greek, and two, to make this point. The us that I reference here are those whom Paul writes these amazing words of comfort. Those who believe in Christ crucified for the forgiveness of their sins. Those whose hope is built on the solid rock of their crucified and risen Savior, and those who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy. To those people, I ask you, who can condemn them? Who can hope to point a finger at those who trust in Almighty God for deliverance? St. Paul expands on this question. Can anything on this earth, no matter how big, how terrible, how anxiety-inducing, condemn us to the separation of Christ from Christ's love? What, out of all of those fears and anxieties we listed, has that kind of power? St. Paul asks, can anything hope to undo the mighty act which he accomplished for us on Calvary's cross? Can tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No? Well, what about politics or the media or COVID-19 or even death itself? Does the supposed curse of 2020 separate you from Christ's all-availing sacrifice? No. And more no. Hear again these words, Christ Jesus is the one who died, who more than that was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Remember the accusation and judgment of the law which has pronounced you guilty and deserving of death? Christ Jesus has borne this judgment on your behalf. Christ Jesus has died your death, rising victorious to never die again. There is no curse of man or angel or demon strong enough to undo what he has done for you. Whether things start to get better or, God forbid, become still worse, you, dear friends, are baptized into Christ. You are his own cherished children, a people for his own possession. You are an individual for whom Christ gave his life an individual whom Christ has called his own, one whom he now petitions for at the right hand of the Father. This is what St. Paul means when he writes that God be for us. He didn't merely mean that God is okay with us, 
or that we can live on in peace so long as we don't stoke the flames and provoke God's wrath. No. God is active in the care for his children. Our concerns are the concerns of our Savior, and he not only takes them to heart, he actively addresses our needs with his good and gracious gifts. Our God grants healing to our woes and the assurance of his presence. He gives us the forgiveness of sins by his own authoritative decree. He accomplishes for us victory over death through the all-availing sacrifice of Jesus. And you, dear brothers and sisters, you are now called God's elect. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? No one. For God himself has justified you. Whether it is in good times or bad times, he remains your God. He remains the one who made you, and you better believe that he will remain the one to preserve you in tribulation and even death. This is the trust that we have in Christ Jesus our Lord, that just as he was there at our inception, just as he came to suffer and die for our sake, so also will he come for us again to deliver us from all mortal struggles and the wages of sin which so plague us in this present day. God is faithful to us, and so we place our faith in him. For just as St. Paul says, I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In short, there is nothing God wouldn't do to keep us with him. Rest assured, my fellow elect, in this certain comfort that united to Christ, nothing in all the world could separate us from his everlasting love. In his most holy name, amen. May the peace of God, which far surpasses all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in the same Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. Together, we make confession of our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, and for all people according to their needs. Lord of mercy, Hear the prayers of your people who call upon you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty God, your love once created all things and set apart a people of promise. Grant to us faith that we believe your word, heed the call of your love, and find peace in your gift of salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Blessed Father, your love is our great treasure and your kingdom our gift. Grant that we, with bold voice, make known your salvation to all the ends of the earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, you established your church and endowed her with your word and sacraments. Bless all pastors and missionaries as they serve us in your name with your gifts and grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Mighty God, you have set over us leaders who exercise the authority of the state for our protection against enemies and for justice against evildoers. Bless the President, Congress of these United States, and all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Compassionate God, 
Your son was wounded for our transgressions, and in his wounds are healing and strength. Hear us on behalf of all the sick, those who suffer, the grieving, and the dying. Most especially do we lift up Jerry and Jean Albers, Jean Antilla, Pat Ballou, Carol Ebling, Linda Gantz, Riley Kirkey, Kim Mitchell, Norm Papke, Jimmy Rodriguez, Nancy Seitz, Norma Shackley, Ed Shaw, Don Weaver, Joe Ziegler, Tom Zimmerman, Wanda Bullhorst, Tim Crouch, Reverend Jeff Geisler, Pike Granis, Ivy Hake, Gene Schaefer, and all those we name now in our hearts. Grant them all that is needed to support them in their hour of need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of grace, you have given to us the gift of work and the privilege of using the fruits of our labors for the support of our families and ourselves. Give us a generous heart that we give aid to the poor and honor to you with the worship of our hearts and the tithes and offerings of our hands. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Wonderful Counselor, by your Holy Spirit, you move our hearts and mouths to confess your holy name to our neighbor. Be with those who by their vocation honor you and serve one another. Most especially do we lift up all the teachers in our community as they prepare to return to their tasks in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Strengthen and preserve them, as well as all the children they serve, that all would be kept secure in your grace and mercy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen.
我们。